Um, so I'm going to talk today about uh, condensate stabilization. You know, of course, with uh, things that are going on in the uh, world right now and in the hydrocarbon markets right now, um, optimizing gas plants and trying to produce and ensure that we're doing production as well as possible is a pretty important subject. So I think this is kind of timely and, rele and relevant. Um, and, and of course, you know, when we talk about this for, for us, we like to talk about the liquid side a lot and, and a lot of the work that we've done with uh, JP3 measurements. If you're not familiar with JP3, they're an uh, awesome Texas-based company that brought a new technology to the market really all coming close to being a decade ago was when I think I was working with them and they're bringing, putting this technology out and uh, has really made a lot of changes to how we do some measurement things and how we can do some optimization. And so uh, my agenda for today talks a little bit about talking about who Insight Analytical is. I usually lead off a lot of these uh, presentations with that, talk a bit about who we are, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about gas processing plants and specifically what kind of happens at the inlet side of a gas processing plant, and then talk about optimization of those uh, unit oh, operations okay. and add on uh, at the end, talk about how we you know, apply near infrared spectroscopy to, uh, to that optimization and, and help to maximize value for uh, gas plants, especially those producing a lot of liquids. <laughs> Got a little kid in the background. Um, Hello. Inside Analytical's Calgary-based systems integrator and distributor, we run out of a, about a 20,000 square foot shop up in northeast of Calgary. Got great access to it. 10 ton crane that goes right outside one of the bay doors. We can pull a full uh, shelter in off the back of a flatbed, do complete systems integration at our site. Um, for the Americans, it won't matter as much, but for the Canadian guys, we're an AB83 compliant fabricator. It means we can build devices that have Canadian registration numbers, um, which are required for press, uh, pressure vessels or things that are gonna be running at high pressures. When we talk about the JP3 analyzer, one of the unique things we can do is do all of our measurements at full line pressure. Um, so we've done projects with CRN for Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, BC. A lot of the people here I've worked with for a long time at different facilities. And so um, I've brought a great group together. We've got excellent documentation, drafting, technical design resources behind us. We've worked with most of the major engineering companies. Uh, we have a journeyman electrician on staff. Um, everything we do, of course, has uh, CSA for Canada. And we do full factory exceptions tests right here at the facility. Oops, went backwards there. We'll do full systems integration from custom design sample systems to process analyzer integrations, PLC and automation to full analyzer buildings. We've worked on projects right from the front end engineering design side uh, through to detailed design and engineering. Um, obviously we do fabrication and that's kind of where our, our raison d'etre is to build these systems and help install and commission them. And service is a big deal for us. So we run a reasonably large service group and are able to uh, service all the products that we uh, build systems around and install. I, uh, I teach a course internationally on how to design analyzer sample systems. And of course, for most analyzers, one of the key things is that you have the right sample system in front of it. It's one of the areas that we specialize in. And, uh, and love to work on complex sampling problems. So we're gonna start off a bit by talking about gas processing plants and especially kind of what happens on the inlet side of these plants, because that's where there's some really good opportunities to optimize and kind of what you do at the front end ends up affecting everything that happens on the back end of the plant as well. So when we have produced fluids coming in, 
Typically, this is going to be uh, a very rich gas that's coming in, may have some entrained liquids, especially water, liquid hydrocarbons coming in, in with it. And so often the first thing we'll see is inlet separation. And so we'll look at an inlet separator here. And essentially what happens there is we get water coming out at the bottom. We'll have a liquid hydrocarbon that's a natural gas condensate. And we'll see vapors going off to the overhead. On the vapor side, you know, this is where we'll end up producing things like sales quality natural gas. So it'll often go through some acid gas removal. Uh, this may be scrubbing H2S, removing CO2 from it, some dehydration, and then we'll end up with, you know, produced natural gas to markets. This natural gas condensate side gets taken off to produce liquid condensates. And that we'll talk about a bit gets further separated for the light ends to go off to the, typically the NGL side and the C3 plus streams. But there's a big opportunity to optimize uh, what happens at the condensate stabilization side and produce better condensate and potentially more volume of condensate. So on the inlet separation side of a gas plant, what we're really trying to do is separate gases off to the top of a tower, water off to a bottom, and get this hydrocarbon stream that comes off in the middle. And it's all going to be determined by running the inlet sides of the plant at the right temperatures and pressures. You know, just like our bottle of 7-Up, we lower the pressure off of it, more gases come off, we cool it, we keep more of those gases in the liquid side. And so we can use temperature and pressure as a mechanism to operate, uh, optimize how we separate gases from liquids, but we need to probably do some other measurements to figure out, well, what's the right temperature and pressure set points? So that hydrocarbon liquid that came off the middle fit uh, stages went over to something that we'll often refer to as a condensate stabilizer, as we see over here. And if we can optimize that, um, the operation of these sort of upstream vessels, we can maximize our product volumes. We can minimize um, how much energy we have to uh, use for gas compression. We can minimize how much energy we use for reboiling. And so, you know, both of these although it's not a major part of the optimization piece, both of these affect CO2 emissions. And everybody you know, gets concerned with that these days. That's the big talk of all the news is always about greenhouse gas emissions. And so we can reduce emissions while at the same time increasing product volumes, increasing penalties, and, or sorry, increasing revenues and minimizing penalties. So, you know, on the Canadian distribution system, there's penalties associated with putting too rich or too much low uh, molecular weight, high vapor pressure product into crude oils or condensates. And so you want to try to make sure you're running close to that edge because it allows you to increase volumes, while at the same time, you don't want to go over that edge because there's going to be financial impacts associated with that. So it becomes a balancing act. We want to uh, try to not push too much of the C4 minuses. You know, this, by, this, by this, I mean, basically methane, ethane, propane, butanes. We don't want too much of those going into our product because it'll cause it to have high vapor pressures and, uh, and the specification in Canada is specifically around how much of those products are in our condensates. At the same time, we don't want to boil out too much of them because we'll have too low a vapor pressure, we'll reduce that C4 minus content by a lot, and that reduces our production volumes. So some people will say, well, that's okay. I just have to optimize my temperatures and my pressures in my tower once, and then that's how I'm going to run. 
The problem is the optimum set points for those towers changes as your feed changes. So if you bring on different wells, you add a new supplier, all of those things can change over time. Even ambient temperature changes can impact that because they impact what happens at wellheads and at any upstream separations. And so we wanna be prepared to deal with the changes in product that's coming into the plant and optimize how that condensate stabilizer is running. And, you know, we talk a lot about condensate stabilizers here, but, you know, at the same time in the U.S., they produce a lot of lighter crude oils compared to what we produce in Canada. And so they'll have heater treaters out near the production heads. Then again, there's an opportunity to optimize those heater treater operations and make sure that you're meeting vapor pressure specs or pipelines. So in Canada, you know, we often will have, we want to be aware of things like what's our reference density that's, uh, that's out there for condensates. And it depends a little bit on the pipeline specs. And so in, in typical ones right now, is there's going to be a penalty if you're over 750 kilograms per cubic meter. There's, uh, there's a credit also if you're under. So density is an important thing to optimize as, on as well. So we can look at the density of the API gravity of the condi and try to optimize that as well. Slipping more butane in is going to help you get that credit for being under the density numbers, but you may be off on the DMC4 or how much light ends are in there. So we calculate what's referred to as deem C4 minus as three times the sum of the ethane, the methane, and the propane. And we add in the concentrations of the butanes, the NC4 and the IC4. So that's how our deem C4 calculation works. And in Canada, you get no credit for being under on that. But if you go over on that, there's a substantial penalty. It is basically, we're not going to pay you for any volume that we associate with the excess of the light ends. And so, like I say, it's, we have a real opportunity for optimization here because we like to put as much of those light ends in, they lower our density, and they increase our production volumes. But at the same time, we don't want to put too much because there's penalties associated with that. So the optimization now that we're talking about is to adjust the temperature, perhaps recirculation rates, and perhaps pressures to optimize the production of condensate. If we do that, we're also usually going to minimize the amount of energy consumption, which is going to lower, re we're going to lower the reboiler temperatures, and we're going to lower the amount of overheads volume that's going to compression. And that allows us, and we optimize that stabilizer set point, but that stabilizer set point is going to change as inlet separation changes. So if we change streams coming in, we're going to find that that changes where the set point, the optimum set point for our condensate stabilizer is. So to truly optimize that stabilizer, what we'd ideally like to do is measure the chemical composition of the stream that's leaving the stabilizer and see if it meets all of our requirements. Historically, that has often been something that people have tried to do with a, a gas chromatograph. Historically, also people have found that that doesn't work out very well. Not because there's any issues with the gas chromatograph, but because the samples we have to deal with when we're dealing with these fractionation towers are often very difficult for the sample systems for the analyzers. When we think about how that plant was laid out, our fluid that came straight from wellheads came into the inlet separator, and the liquids that came off the bottom of that 
went over to the condensate stabilizer. With those liquids often goes a lot of the sand, the clay, the dirt, a lot of the uh, physical mechanical contamination that's in the inlet stream ends up in that stabilizer bottoms. And, and especially when we're dealing with some of the uh, shale plays that are produced, those condensates can also have a lot of waxes in them. And so when we try to put that through an analyzer sample system, it can be problematic, especially because things like traditional gas chromatographs and um, physical property type analyzers like online vapor pressure analyzers often have really small tubing runs. They have things like eighth inch, even 16th inch tubing. As a result, these materials, things like that sand, clay, dirt, if it gets into injection valves, onto seals for a moving piston and a vapor pressure analyzer, all of those uh, places where it gets to, it causes a lot of mechanical issues. And it leads to really high sample system maintenance costs and very high operating costs for these devices. So we're gonna talk about a different way to do that kind of measurement. First, I wanna talk a little bit about the economics of doing it though, because there's a good reason economically to do these things. When we're running a condensate stabilizer, there may be various specifications or requirements. It may be the specification is put on vapor pressure, or it may be that the vapor pressure is put on chemical composition and how much C4 minus there is in there. So, but the first thing we're gonna think about is what we do at the stabilizer. So we take this condensate and we put it into a tower. And what we're doing is applying heat to it while controlling the pressure of it. We're applying heat to any condi that we recirculate in the bottoms and we're trying to drive vapors off to the top. So like most fractionation towers, we're expecting that the light ends are gonna go up here and the heavier stuff goes down here. What we wanna do is make sure that we meet any specifications down here and at the same time, maximize our volume. We get paid by the barrel, so we want to produce as many barrels as we can. We just want to make sure those barrels are on spec. So, again, in, in Canada, our spec is this has to have less than 5% if you like butanes. Sorry, this is an old slide when prices are a lot different. So we were running these at a time when Condi was selling at $20 a barrel. I looked at it today. The strip price is 102 USD per barrel. So the economic justification I'm gonna make here, it was done when the five, price was five times less. Um, but a lot of people, because they didn't wanna pay the penalties, would overstrip their condensate. And if we were producing this condensate, for spec was less than five, but if we were producing it and overstripping it and stripping it down to two, we're basically missing three barrels of production because we could have put a th net of three barrels of condi at the bottom end of the plant. And so now if we put an analyzer in there for uh, into process control, we put the JP3 analyzer in there, use the infrared spectroscopy to measure the chemical composition or the vapor pressure of the, of the product fluid, we can start to optimize how much heat we put in. And typically that means put in less energy, which means burning less fuel and keep more of those liquids into the bottoms. So take that production up and we add an extra 3% on the production side. So, if we do that at today's prices, we're talking about producing an extra three barrels for every hundred barrels that was coming in, we're gonna produce an extra three. And we can talk about seeing, you know, 
pretty rapid payoff of an analyzer installation. And in fact, I'm going to give you an example of an actual site we did. So where the economic value comes in is by looking at the custody transfer specifications, seeing where those penalties are applied and where the benefits are. And we quickly realize that what we want to do is run as close to 5% as possible, but ideally not over. Sorry, take my glasses off to be able to see. Right at the top up here, you'll see it's kind of small, but I went to take a look today at the strip prices. And there you go, C5 plus, $102 a barrel, up 1.9%. The weekly, it's been as low over the last year, it's been as low as $60 and as high as 127. So again, you know, your value, your economic value, what's going on at a facility is gonna change some, to some extent based on what these spot prices are. But I did this calculation here down below again for another presentation. We had a client who was producing around 400 cubic meters a day. He had an opportunity to get that up to about 406 cubic meters a day just by optimizing the set point for the stabilizer. At that time, Condi was about $512 a cubic meter. I think it's about 6.4 barrels in a, in a meter cubed. Oops. So today it's more like $800 per cubic meter. Um, but that payback for him on an extra six extra cubic meters a day of production was $3,000 a day, over a thousand dollars, over a million dollars in a year. And that's not including the energy savings that occur, the pre compression savings that occur, and also not being in this position of paying penalties. So optimizing stabilizers requires that we measure composition. There'll be people who try to tell you that we can do this with a data fusion model that will monitor your flow rates and your temperatures and pressures. And based on some historical things we'll see, we'll try to tell you how you should run your stabilizer now. And in my opinion, it really doesn't work because as soon as you bring on new wells or change anything else that's happening on the inlet side of the plant, it's going to change all the impact of that historical data. So you can try to put things like that in and say, I'm just going to run off temperature pressure. And most people find they won't, they'll end up having periods where they're paying penalties or they're running way on the low end. People can try to put it in, do this with gas chromatographs, but GCs are complex. They have small tubing, lots of parts, moving parts that just aren't compatible with waxes and clay and asphaltines. It causes a lot of plugging problems. And they end up having a lot of consumables, carrier gas changes, filter changes, replacing injection valves. They're also just difficult to troubleshoot. If you look at kind of a, the inside of one of these GC ovens, me a rat's nest of tubing. And so all of those things create complexity. So as I said, we put these near infrared analyzers in to try to deal with that. And what has been our experiences with clients? We did a gas plant in central Alberta here. They had some three-year-old GCs, but they were just a lot of maintenance to them. Their maintenance on, when the plant manager talked to the instrument guys, they said, the GCs in our liquid service are our biggest headache, constantly requiring service. So they replaced those GCs with uh, a new with the JP3, been operational, robust. They're able to optimize their performance, optimize their plant output, and do a lot less maintenance on that side of the plant. We had a major midstreamer that already had a full gas chromatograph and an online RVP analyzer installed in a very elaborately done, well done shelter. Great sample system on it. And they were saying that it had over $50,000 a year in parts and support because of the constant filter changes, wear and downtime on the system and carrier gas costs. Uh, uh, costs. 
So again, we replaced it with a newer technology, five years in service and minimal maintenance. We recently did a installation at a major gas plant up in the Montany. They had brand new GCs that they could never get to run. And they tried for two years, basically being in startup mode. Done 200 grand in factory service and still not working. And so we replaced it again with the infrared technology, fully up operational models built. When we went and visited with the plant, they said the increased production paid for the, the installation in the first six weeks. So again, you know, really fast response, fast payback on these things. So what's the solution that we've been implementing? It's a near infrared spectroscopy, shoots a beam of light through the sample from the way the light gets attenuated by the hydrocarbons, we can determine the hydrocarbon compositions and physical properties. No moving parts, typically plumbed all in half inch tubing and pipe. So big diameter stuff that doesn't plug very easily runs at line pressures and temperatures. So we don't have any risks of phase change in the sample. Fast near real time analysis. You know, a typical either phys prop, physical property or GC is gonna be on something like a six minute cycle time. We're typically 30 seconds. And that's important when you're trying to optimize control loops. And so we can get faster response, more reliable, accurate, accurately, full support via the cloud. We can log into the analyzer, do remote diagnostics. Um, on the Canadian side, we run service support out of Grand Prairie, out of Edmonton, out of Calgary. JP3, as I might have mentioned, is out of Austin, Texas. So they uh, their head office in Austin, but they have service people across continental US. So why the near infrared? When we when I first used to do presentations and try to talk to people and say, you know, we're gonna measure what's going on in your crude oil or your condi. Um, by shooting a beam of light through it. People would almost laugh. They go, have you ever seen our fluids? You're not getting light through our fluids. And what you have to realize is crude oil and things like that is opaque in the visible. It absorbs all of the visible light. That's why it looks dark and black. But as we get beyond the visible side of the spectrum, beyond the red, and we go into the near infrared, it absorbs a lot less of the light. It lets light go through it. And so it transmits light, but we get out to a region that starts at around 1600 nanometers. And there all the hydrocarbons start to absorb again, but they absorb with very characteristic shapes. And so from the shape of the absorption band, we can identify what hydrocarbons are there. And from how big the absorption bands are, we can quantify how much of them are there. So, Using near infrared spectroscopy allows us to do both a quantitative and a qualitative analysis of what's in a pipe. So all that's great. That solves that. That says, how do we do the measurement? But how do we make it robust? And part of that is how it's been implemented, how JP3 implemented this. What we do is we have a, what we refer to as a flow cell. And basically it's a mechanical block, 316 stainless steel. Uh, large diameter flow pass, half inch. And we allow process fluid to come in and flow through that. So we show the process fluid here in black. It's flowing through that flow cell, and inside the flow cell, there's two synthetic sapphire rods. Sapphire is very good for being able to transmit infrared light, and it's also the second hardest thing next to diamond. And so it doesn't get scratched by sand and things like that. So we can have very abrasive materials in there and not damage the optical surfaces. 
So we allow fluid to flow between these two sapphire rods and we shoot our beam of light across it. The beam of light goes through it and we look for what wavelengths have been absorbed and attenuated. And from that, again, we can tell what chemicals are present, their physical properties, and do that in near real time. It allows us to move the measurement out near the sample point. By the way, if there's any questions as I'm going through this, please feel free to interrupt. Sorry, I usually say that at the beginning. I certainly don't mind getting interrupted as I go through this. I have three kids. I'm used to it all the time. Um, what we're able to do then, because we can shoot that infrared light out over a fiber optic, we can actually move the measurement right close to the process point. And so what we do is we mount this flow cell very close to the sample point, run a short run of tubing up, and allow process fluid to go through that cell and return back to process. So we look for some source of differential pressure. This could be an orifice plate, could be a pump, could just be a, we're sampling from a process line and return to tankage. That's a lower pressure. Um, we just, we need a few pounds of differential to drive flow through this and that's it. So now we have flow going through the cell. We have that cell mounted out remotely. We put the analyzer back. The way I look, view this is kind of the flow cell is where all the mechanical things are happening. And the analyzer itself is kind of the brains of the whole game. We shoot a beam of light out over fiber optic from wherever we've mounted the analyzer bring it back over another fiber optic to where the analyzer is. The important thing to realize about this, the analyzer doesn't, doesn't actually physically touch process fluid. We don't bring process fluid to where the analyzer is. So it means we can put the analyzer in a blending building, a control room, an MCC building, and not put any special gas detection or any of the other life support things that we normally put around an analyzer insulation, which really helps to mitigate some of the insulation costs. So now that we shot the beam of light out across it, we bring the beam of light back. That's where all the, now all the action happens at the brain side. There's sophisticated algorithms in there that take that light attenuation pattern that we saw, run it through some mathematical algorithms, and calculate all the things that we need, whether it's on a deethanizer where we might do a C1 through C6, on a condensate stabilizer, we might look at some of the heaviers like out to C9 plus. We can look at physical properties like vapor pressure, API gravity, viscosity, boiling point fractions, and we can do this all in gases or in liquids. And so one of the other unique things about this analyzer is we can do completely different measurements at different measurement points. We can have this one out here and it can be working on condensate. And we can run a second set of fibers out here and it might be looking at our natural gas or it might be looking at crude oil. So we can support up to four different measurement points on this. There's actually another version that'll go up to eight different measurement points. Traditionally, what we've installed in Canada have been either the single stream versions, excuse me, single stream versions or the eight stream versions. But if we're going into like a frac plant, gas processing facility, multiple different uh, unit operations going on in there, we can use one analyzer to measure on different trains. So we have installations, I'm gonna show one coming up in a couple, uh, a couple slides, picture of one where we're doing the deethanizer bottoms, condensate stabilizer bottoms, debutanizer reflux drum, truck out of propane to propane trucks. Um, different sample points all through the plant. These make for really simple installations too. This is a crude oil blending skid. So inside the building is the brains part, the physical analyzer. And they just ran the sample out through one of the sample lines. Oops, why is my pen not writing? 
ran the sample out. It runs past a flow switch. That's the thing you see in yellow. Goes up to the measurement cell. That gray jacket over it is just a heat, a cover that has a heater inside of it. Keeps the flow cell as the warmest point so we don't get any waxes dropping out of there. And returns back into the building again. So no recovery tanks, no real sample system to speak of. We're just running crude oil through the flow cell and we're doing a real-time vapor pressure measurement. It allows them, they're allowed to put butane into their crude oil as long as they don't exceed the vapor pressure spec. So it allows them to optimize their blending. So basically that's the entire system. Um, simple, easy to maintain, requires virtually no maintenance. This unit was running for nine, well, nine and a half months with nobody physically touching it. And actually the only reason we got a service call about it was their Modbus communications locked up and they were trying to figure out how they got, how to get Modbus back up and running. And so, you know, these can be very low maintenance installs. We typically try to mount that flow panel that you saw inside this box is exactly what you saw on the other one. This is a condensate stabilizer installation. We try to mount it as close as we can to the sample point. Our sample valve is right there. We come over, flow through this analyzer, and end up returning on the backside of that control valve. So really short sample line runs lets us get uh, very fast response over to the analyzer. It gets our fluid over to the analyzer quickly, and then the analyzer itself has very fast response. Talking about installing it, you know, in, in whatever building we have available. Again, this is a different installation. Um, so you see again that fiber, fiberglass panel. We often do stainless steel panels now. Um, inside of it, a very similar looking analyzer layout. It's mounted right out of the facility, close to where the stabilizer is. The analyzer itself is mounted over here in an MCC building. So they had an electrical building, they said, great, we'll put the analyzer on the wall, we'll run the electrical IO and the fibers down to it. And inside the analyzer, what we see is spectrometer, PLC, single board computer. Up top, power supplies, network switches, because it communicates both over four to 20 milliamps and over Modbus on TCP IP or RS-485 as well it has a satellite connection or a cellular connection into it. So we can monitor daily data remotely as well. Multi-stream installation. So again, this was a plant. They had had GCs in there. They said, we'd like to replace our GCs. We want you to go in the same analyzer building. And so we were able to put the, the brain part, the JP3 part up on the wall there, and then put in four flow panels. So you can see two of the flow panels here. And if you look in the picture down here, this is DF, DBUT, condensate stabilizer, truck out to uh, storage. Install all four flow panels, fast commissioning. We have one multi-stream analyzer now dealing with streams of you know quite different chemical composition and providing again real-time data. So when we look at I feel, yes sir the question so multi-stream like um, it's a multi-channel analyzer right mm -hmm. yep so basically if actually let me go back one picture here and I can't draw when I zoom in, but um, if you look down there on the spectrometer on the at the black box on the lower in the lower part of the cabinet, you can see four silver pieces there with little red dots on them. And those are where the fiber connections would be on the return side. On the left hand side of that box, you can see there's a fiber connected and three little green uh, pieces standing out. 
those are where additional fibers would connect. So the spectrometer is set up that it sequentially goes from measuring, shooting a beam of light on, out on one fiber, making a measurement on one of the detectors, then it steps over to the next fiber, shoots a beam of light out on that one, making a measurement on the next detector. So on a four stream system, we would end up with about two minute response between cycling 30 seconds on each measurement point. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. And Phil, not to interrupt, this is Nate Watson with JP3. If that two minute is a concern, we are actively working to, because that right now is not hardware limited, that's software limited, and we're actively working to make that faster. Yeah, I think I've been hearing numbers like being down to a few seconds uh, point if, if necessary. Um, so, so when we look at, you know, a traditional gas chromatograph or physical property analyzer, um, the advantage we see about using the near infrared, especially on some of these difficult process streams, is that we get to measure very close, almost right at the process, measuring at line pressures and temperatures so we don't have any phase changes. Whereas with a typical analyzer, we'll have to transport the sample over to a remote analyzer building and make the measurement remotely. And it's often in that sample transport and sample conditioning part where we change temperatures, pressures, and uh, we have the potential for changing phases that we have a lot of our problems. A lot of the traditional analyzers, and remember many of the analyzers we use were really based on lab analyzers. And in the lab, we have all sorts of opportunities to filter and clean up our samples and adjust their temperatures and pressures. But you know, a lot of these analyzers in the lab was fine to have eighth inch tubing. But for process applications, especially dirty processes, eighth inch and 16th inch tubing plugs off really easily. In the, on this near infrared analyzer, we run all our flow in half inch tubing or pipe. We don't put any filters or regulators in. We're very tolerant to the fact that our stream may have some particles and contamina contamination in there. Um, on a lot of our traditional analyzers, we have to put redundant filtering in. And oftentimes that filtering becomes a lot of the maintenance. We'll typically see, even with sample transport, 30 second response time, we're usually faster than one minute response time for the entire system. Whereas traditional, it might be 15 minutes. We see sample systems that have hours of response time. We can do, the cool thing, one of the cool things is, is we can run multiple models as well. So a single analyzer might be doing, we have, for example, analyzer within Canna that is doing C1 through C4 and liquid volume percent. It's doing C1 through C12 in mole percent. And it's doing vapor pressure. Um, all of that happening in near real time. If we were to try to do that on traditional analyzers, we probably would have needed three analyzers. The downsides or the, you know, where, where you can say, well, but a traditional analyzer is a more direct measurement. An RVP analyzer is trying to measure vapor pressure. Whereas we're using an infrared model and it becomes an inferred measurement. Um, so we have to build models and that can take a bit of time. We'll often be on site pulling samples and building the uh, model for several weeks to try to get that model all tuned in. If it's a standard application with very similar products, it can be faster than that. But, you know, again, I like to say, like, we're going to have to build a model. Um, the other thing is, is because we're looking at any light absorption technique, and Lex, with the exception of TDLs, um, traditionally, you're looking in a region where all the molecules are absorbing. So it's better to do bulk co uh, composition, doing things in the thousands of ppm to percent levels. Chromatographs and some of our other analyzers can do trace compounds a lot better. You know, they can do, if you want to measure single digit H2S or uh, low levels of sulfur in a, in a liquid stream, you may not have a choice but to go to something like a GC. 
from an install base perspective, there's again, this is an older slide, so it may be off by a bit. There's over, there's between two and 300 installed in the US right now, with hundreds literally, you know, get approaching a thousand measurement points. They're in all active basins across the US. And you can kind of see them up here in the Bakken, Permian, Marcellus. Um, it's a great mix uh, between crude oil applications, condensate stabilizers, NGL liquids, natural gas, NGL products, refined fuel applications. Big application for JP3 in the US because they've got a lot more refineries is looking at things like transmix and pipelines when they switch from one product to another. Here in Canada, we've got over 40 installations now, well over 60 measurement points. Again, with a good mix between NGLs, condensates, crude oil applications. Um, so I kind of usually finish up with just a little bit more about Insight. We've got a pretty wide range of product lines that we cover. Um, JP3 is really, JP3 is kind of our raison d'etre, if you like. Insight started because I was working with JP3 in the US on the technology side of it and, and said, how are you guys gonna sell this in Canada? And when they saw they didn't have sort of an established sales channel already figured out, I said, let me build a sales channel for it. But since then, we've started to work with a number of other companies and brought on a number of product lines. All of the information about those is on our website. You're gonna get an email of our slides and this is an active uh, hyperlink up here that'll just take you to our product line card, if you like. And it gives you a brief description of all the products that we sell. Um, and we usually do webinars about a lot of these. I think our next one is at the end of May and is gonna be about the extra mass spectrometers. I think we're looking maybe into June for that one, Phil. Oh, the right. Extra, the next webinar there. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 we're doing two or three trade shows in the next month. We got to get through month. a couple of those first. Absolutely. That's right. We're in May already, aren't we? We are in May. Here we are. <laughs> Thanks, Grace. <laughs> Just, sometimes I don't know what morning it is. Sometimes I don't know what month it is. Um, I think a lot of us are in that same boat these days, Phil. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what next? If you have an application, contact us. We'll happily do an application review. If we don't have the right technology for an application, we're happy to tell you, you know, if I was doing that measurement, this is how I'd do it. Um, with the JP3s, we can fit in pretty well anywhere across the hydrocarbon processing industry, from refined fuels to upstream and midstream applications, natural gas, NGL, liquids, crude, all are kind of in our wheelhouse. Um, last slide on here, I'll just invite you guys to, uh, you know, feel free to check out our website, um, contact uh, Scott or Grace, uh, both on our sales, sales and marketing market side, or contact myself. I don't know why the slide should up like this. Scotty gets his name underlined, his email underlined and in blue, and Grace and I are just normal. But uh, anyways, that wraps me up for today. Hopefully I managed to do that all within the hour and uh, won't keep too much more of your time but happy to take any other questions. If not, if any of you are in the US, we're gonna be down at Isham uh, in Oklahoma next week and at the Analyzer Technology Conference in Galveston, Texas, uh, the week after that, Grace is gonna be at the Calgary ISA. And we'll have a booth and some hardware and some info there. Thanks, everybody. I'll say for your hi. Time. Yes, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. Have a great one.